welcome to Conversations with Matt DeLockery. In the last episode, we talked about how the canon was formed. Today, we're going to look at the process of copying and recopying of the documents in the New Testament canon. However, this process started long before the canon settled into its final form, so we have to go back to the beginning. We've got almost 2,000 years of history to cover today, so strap yourselves in and get ready, because here we go. Let's begin with the very first copies. A letter was sent, maybe by Paul or someone else. But, and we talked about this in the episode on letters, it's not like the author would send his only copy away. Most authors would make one or more copies. If you send a letter, especially if it was important or you spent a lot of time on it, you would want a copy. This was literally your sent mail. And so you know, this wasn't just a Christian thing. This was an everybody thing. And not only would the sender make copies, the churches receiving letters would make copies. Some might be for themselves, and others might be to share with the churches near them. And the same thing would happen with Gospels or anything else. Now, as time went on, either manuscripts would deteriorate and or more people would want copies. So, copies were made of the copies. And copies were made of the copies of the copies. Now, because travel back then was not what it is today, people tended to stay pretty much in one place. So what ended up happening was that things called local texts developed. When a new congregation was started in or near a large city, they would be given copies of the scriptures that were common or standard in that area. As the process of copying continued, each area tended to retain its own particular version with its own particular variations. And that makes sense. Think about it. If someone makes a mistake X in City 1, then the people who copy from that manuscript will probably copy mistake X as well. But in City 2, mistake X wouldn't have been made. Mistake Y would have been made. And people copying from that manuscript would make mistake Y. So mistake Y shows up in City 2. See how this works? Today, scholars can actually identify where a manuscript probably came from by comparing its unique variations with scripture quotations from church fathers who lived in or near the main centers of Christianity, Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, etc. So, you know, church fathers were important people from early Christianity, and we still have many of their writings today. They are men like Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Oregon, Tertullian, Augustine, and so forth. Now, there were some times when a letter or book would be taken to another city and influence their version, but generally, local versions were what continued. So, what happened was not all of the manuscripts being supervised by a central body that ensured that they wrote down particular things. No, this happened more organically. And what happened was that as there began to be main centers of Christianity, there also became distinct types of text. There are three types of local texts, the ones we've been talking about that are centered in particular areas, that are most important to understanding all this manuscript stuff. First, you have the Alexandrian text, which is associated with Alexandria, Egypt. These are usually considered to be the best texts at preserving the original. The copyists tended to try not to polish the text, and more often than not, they left things as they were. If you've ever heard of the Codex Vaticanus or Codex Sinaiticus, these are Alexandrian texts. This text type can be traced back to the early 2nd century. Second, you have the Western text, which was focused primarily in Italy, Gaul, more or less modern-day France, so a bit bigger, as well as North Africa and elsewhere. Western texts tended to paraphrase things. Anything from words to whole sentences could be added, deleted, or changed for various reasons. And, similar to the Alexandrian text type, Western texts can be traced back to the second century. Third, and finally, there is the Byzantine text, which originated in Antioch, Syria, which is maybe 450 miles or so roughly north of Jerusalem, close to where modern-day Syria and Turkey meet. These are the latest of the main types of text. Copies try to smooth the language so the manuscripts read clearly, but sometimes is because they tried editing things out that made the text bumpy, if you will. From about the 6th to the 7th century, through the inventing of the printing press in the middle of the 15th century, Byzantine texts were seen as the best version of the New Testament manuscripts. As such, New Testaments that came out on Gutenberg's press used the Byzantine text. Now, we're about to make a huge jump in our story, because for almost a thousand years, these local texts existed pretty much independently. 
They were copied and used in their individual areas and pretty much stayed there. It is only around the time of the Reformation that things began to change. So, our story picks up in 1516, when a man named Erasmus published the first ever Greek New Testament. I say first, but it's not like there were not New Testaments in Greek prior to this. There certainly were, but Erasmus's Greek New Testament marks the beginning of the effort to try to compile all of the available manuscripts into one version. Unfortunately, Erasmus didn't have a lot to work with. He primarily relied on two poor manuscripts, both from around the 12th century. He compared them to two or three others and actually had to back-translate the last six verses of Revelation from Latin to Greek because he didn't have any manuscripts in Greek that contained them. Three years later, in 1519, he came out with a second edition of his Greek New Testament that removed many of the typos, and it is this version that formed the basis for Martin Luther and William Tyndale's translations of the New Testament into German. Now, the problem with all of this is that the textual basis for Erasmus' Greek New Testament was not so good. He was using later Byzantine manuscripts, but at the time, Byzantine ones were what everybody thought was best. However, other people started trying to make their own versions, including Robert Eten and Theodore Beza. Eten published a version in 1550 that contained the first critical apparatus. Basically, a critical apparatus is a way for scholars to compare which manuscripts contain which version of the text. So when there is a place in which one set of manuscripts have one word, a phrase, and another set have another, there would be a little footnote listing which ones have which version. And so you know, Atten's version was the first version of the New Testament that had verse numbers. Again, that was year 1550, so you know. Now, Theodore Beza published nine editions of the Greek New Testament between 1565 and 1604, and then one more after his death in 1611. It was Beza's versions that formed the basis for the King James Bible, which came out in 1611, though the King James Bible most people are familiar with is the updated version from 1769. I actually have a 1611 version, and for several years, when I was going through my King James phase, that's what I use as my regular Bible. You can Google 1611 King James Bible and read it. You'll notice right away that they spelled things a little differently back then. Anyway, there was not a lot of difference between Beza's version and Erasmus's version. They were all basically using the same late Byzantine manuscripts. And every Greek New Testament for the next 200 years or so pretty much stuck with these same manuscripts. It wasn't until the 19th century that things really got going with textual criticism. Textual criticism is basically scholars trying to figure out which version of the text is most likely original. And we'll get to how they do that in just a minute. The textual criticism that began in the 19th century continued and was aided by a lot of manuscript discoveries in the 20th century, so that we have a much better idea of what was originally written. And that brings us up to today. The end result of this process is that today, all scholars pretty much work from the same Greek New Testament. And all students who study Greek in school will use this same version. Now, when you look at a Greek New Testament, when you look at a page, it has two parts. The text that the editorial committee thinks is the most likely original version, and the critical apparatus, which is where the editors list all the variations that can be found on a given verse, you know, whether it reads this way or that way. You can also buy another book by one of the members of the committee, Bruce Metzger, called A Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament a book that has been helpful in putting together this episode. In that book, Metzger explains why the committee thought that a particular version of the text was most likely original. So, all of the variations in the text and all the possible ways that the New Testament could read are open and public, and you can read notes from the committee on why they chose the particular reading they did. What's more, every Greek student in seminary will have to get a Greek New Testament all of which contain a critical apparatus and talk about all of these variations. It's not like all these variations are hidden away somewhere by a group of men in robes telling us, no, you must believe what we tell you. Every person, including you, has access to all of this information. All you have to do is want to learn. Okay, so that basically covers how we got from the original documents written by Paul or John or whoever to the Greek New Testament we have today. And so you know, all scholars work from the same Greek New Testament, even though they don't necessarily agree on which reading is original. What we need to do now is talk about how textual critics decide which version is best. 
And when I say best, I don't mean which one fits our preferred theology. We're looking for what is most original, whether we like it or not. So, when there are multiple variations for a given word or passage, how do scholars decide which is most likely the original one? Let's start by looking at the variations themselves. Basically, there are two types of variations, accidental mistakes and intentional changes. Accidental mistakes are like mistaking a word or letter for another one that looked like it, skipping a line when copying a manuscript because the end of one line had the similar letters or words as the end of the next line. So the copyist would accidentally not copy that line and skip over it because two lines look similar. Copyists might also recopy a line by accident for a similar reason. The beginnings of two lines look the same. Copyists might also confuse letters that are pronounced alike. So as you're copying and saying it to yourself in your head, it's easy to mess up two letters that sound alike. Of course, there were also intentional changes. Copyists might attempt to smooth out the grammar or style in a text. They might attempt to explain passages that are difficult to understand, or they might substitute a word or phrase that seemed more appropriate. In the case of the Gospels, often this might come from one of the parallel passages in another Gospel. So for all of these reasons and others, changes or variations, which is a technical term, found their way into the New Testament manuscripts. How, then, do scholars figure out which reading is most likely the original one? Well, it's one part art, and one part science. But there are some criteria for determining which reading is most likely original that help sort out many of the problems. Basically, there are two types of evidence that scholars look to, external and internal evidence. So, external evidence. Here are some criteria that help scholars figure out which reading is most likely original. 1. Type of text. Alexandrian, Western, Byzantine, etc. We talked about these earlier. Different types of texts tend to carry different levels of accuracy. 2. Date. The earlier the better. This should make sense since we're trying to find out what is most original. 3. Geographical distribution of people who accept a given variation. Do the people who think that a certain version is original all come from the same place, or are they spread out? It's more likely to be a local variation if they all come from the same place. 4. Where the text was copied from. If a whole bunch of copies were made of one bad text, then it doesn't matter how many copies there are. You can't simply count how many there are to determine which is original. You really want to know where a particular manuscript came from. And five, texts that are found to be trustworthy where they can be checked can more likely be trusted where they can't be checked. As far as internal evidence, there are things that scholars can do to look at the text itself to try to determine which reading is most likely original. Here are a few. 1. The more difficult reading is to be preferred because scribes would tend to simplify things rather than make them more complicated. 2. The shorter reading is usually to be preferred because scribes would tend to explain things rather than delete them. 3. The reading that doesn't sound like something else from the Bible is preferred. Sometimes, scribes might make a passage sound like another one like in one of the other synoptic gospels or from an Old Testament quote. The reading that does not sound like the other one is more likely original. 4. Textual scholars also consider what the original author was more likely to have written. They look at the style and vocabulary throughout the rest of the book, immediate context, probable backgrounds of the text, etc., and try to see what is more consistent with John or Peter or whoever. Now, when they have looked at all the variations and considered all the criteria, scholars try to determine what is most likely original. In some cases, this is easy. Some cases, it's not. Let me explain what I mean with a non-biblical example. I've basically taken these criteria straight out of Metzger's book, the one I mentioned previously, though I've shortened them and smoothed them out a bit. Now, if you were to bury both lists of the criteria, both Metzger's and mine, and dug them up and compared them in a thousand years without knowing who wrote them, and look for which was most likely original, how would you do it? Well, you would probably compare them with the sort of criteria we just talked about. And if you compare them, you'll notice that Metzger's is both earlier and has the more difficult reading. Mine is later and smooths things out a bit. If you have a more difficult reading in an early text and a smoother reading in a later text, then you have a pretty good idea of which is original. 
all applicable criteria point toward the difficult reading in an early text. But what if we change up our example a bit? Suppose I and another person both wrote about these criteria, and neither one of us were the original. We were both copying from the same source. And then people made copies of what we wrote, and then other people made copies, and so on and so forth. And suppose we buried them all and dug them up in a thousand years. And what if we only found two of them? And what if in the two we found we had a more difficult reading in a later text compared with a smoother one in an early text? Now your criteria are split. What do you do? Obviously, this takes some work to figure out. So you see why scholars will argue about what is the original reading of a text and what isn't. In many cases, the answer is clear, but sometimes it isn't. And sometimes what we think is most likely original changes. It could be that someone discovers a new manuscript that changes everything. You know, archaeology plays a pretty big role in this, because what Indiana Jones digs up, after he punches a few Nazis, of course, is what scholars back at the university have to work with. But, also as time goes on, new technology has enabled us to be able to read manuscripts that we currently have, but haven't been able to read before. And there's some pretty cool work being done in that field. So let me share with you a few examples of things that were once part of the New Testament, but have since been determined not to be original. First up is John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the woman caught in adultery. Quite a lot of us have heard this story and really like it. You know, the one where a woman is caught in adultery and the crowd is going to stone her, but Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. It's a great story. I like it. Unfortunately, it's not original to the Gospel of John. It's still printed in our Bibles, but if you notice, there are square brackets around it. The editors of various translations of the Bible decided to leave it in there, possibly because everyone was so familiar with it, but there are very few scholars who think it was original to the Gospel. Now that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It could very well be that this was a real occurrence, and it is thought that this passage comes from early oral tradition. However, this passage is absent from early and diverse manuscripts and is generally thought not to be original to the Gospel of John. This is a common way to handle something that is thought not to be original. Translators will often leave a passage or verse in the English version, but they'll put square brackets around it, so that you know that it is widely considered not to be original. The same is true for the next passage we're going to look at. Mark 16, 9-20. Verse 8 is most likely where the Gospel ends, but it ends so abruptly it's not hard to see why someone would have wanted to give it a smoother ending. However, like the woman caught in adultery in John, these verses are included, but they're enclosed by square brackets to let you know that they are not original. So all of the stuff about picking up snakes just wasn't original. Another one that you may or may not have been aware of is the ending of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 6, 13. The prayer actually ends and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or from the evil one. The words, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, were also not original. And, if you notice, they are in brackets as well. Now, this doesn't mean that they're not good. I think the end of the verse is good, theologically. However, if you want to pray the prayer that Jesus actually gave his disciples, as the Gospel of Matthew records it, then you should understand that those words were not original. They were added later. In addition to the examples I just gave you, there are a number of places where there are missing verses in the Bible. Take Acts 8.37 as an example. I'm not going to read it to you. I want you to look it up. Go to BibleGateway.com and look up Acts chapter 8 in different versions. You have to look up the whole chapter and scroll down, because if you look it up in one of the versions in which it's missing, you'll just get a message saying the verse is not found. You see, everyone agrees that this is not original to the book of Acts, but how they deal with that particular issue is different. The NASB includes a verse, but puts brackets around it, like we've talked about already. If you look it up in the ESV, you won't find a verse with the number 37. It just goes from 36 to 38. If you look it up in the NIV, between verses 36 and 38, you'll find the number 37 with brackets around it, but you won't find any text. There is a whole lot of work being done to try to bring you the most accurate New Testament there can be. Now, I don't want to get into the translation question just yet. We'll cover that in the next and final episode in the series. 
However, this isn't a translation question. Sure, different translations show things differently, but this is merely a difference in how they show the underlying reality of what the Greek New Testament says. The real question here is about what words and verses were most likely original to the different books and letters of the Greek New Testament. In order to round out this episode, I want to bring up one final issue that comes up when we talk about manuscripts, and that's the claim that there are so many errors in the Greek New Testament that there's no way that we can trust it. Now, there are several things that I need to do to explain and correct statements like this. One, we're talking about variations, not errors. When people say things like there are hundreds of thousands of errors in the Greek New Testament, what they mean is that there are actually hundreds of thousands of variations. Variation and error are actually technical terms here, and they're not interchangeable. A variation is a place where two manuscripts have different readings. An error would be a place where an author made a mistake, such as recording a wrong historical fact, the wrong name of a town, or something like that. The simple fact is that there are not hundreds of thousands of errors but there are hundreds of thousands of variations. And that brings us to our second point. Two, the variations we are talking about are variations between the many, many copies we have of the various New Testament documents. Let's stop and think about that for a minute. The only way you end up with any variations at all is by having more than one copy, right? I mean, if there were only one copy of the New Testament, then there would be no variations at all. You must have at least two copies of a document for variations to be possible. And if you had 10 or 100 copies, then you would expect to find more variations, right? Well, there are around 5,800 complete or partial manuscripts of the Greek New Testament still surviving today, and that's not even counting manuscripts in other languages. Do you think that having more manuscripts available is going to increase the number of variations or decrease them? It's going to increase them because you're going to have more variations between 5,800 documents than you will 10 or 2. And this brings me to my final point. 3. The number of manuscripts is actually helpful, not hurtful. Sure, having more manuscripts means more variations, but wouldn't you rather have more manuscripts if you're trying to reconstruct the original? I mean, that would only help, right? If you only had a couple, all you could do is say, well, this one says this, but that one says that, So here's my best guess at what the original was. I guess I'm done now. If you have thousands of manuscripts spread out over more than a millennium, you can do a lot more. You can do things like isolate a particular variation and trace it back through copies to see where it originated. You can do things like determine which particular place, a city or group of cities, tended to produce the best documents. With this many manuscripts, you can produce an entire family tree of variations, if you will, and track them through the centuries. This one started here and was continued in these manuscripts. The other one started there and was copied in these manuscripts, but not those. You can't do this if you only have a handful of manuscripts. There are a lot of really neat things you can do with so much data, and the end result of all this is not merely an educated guess as to which variation is most likely original, but an entire picture of the process of transmission through its history. So when people say things like, There are hundreds of thousands of variations in the New Testament manuscripts. It makes a really good soundbite, but it shows a complete lack of understanding of how textual criticism works. Either that, or they know how textual criticism works, and they're only telling you half the truth. The number of variations is only as high as it is because we have so much data. And having a lot of data is good, even if it allows people to make some uninformed and or false statements. Now, I'm telling you that the process of copying and recopying manuscripts is pretty reliable, but you don't have to take my word for it. There's two things you can do to check for yourself pretty easily without even knowing Greek. One, when you're reading your modern English Bibles, look at the footnotes. Occasionally, you'll see a footnote that says, some MSS say X. MSS is short for manuscripts. Many translations will tell you when there is a question about the text behind the translation. If you look at these, you'll notice that most of them really aren't a big deal at all. That's because the places where there are questions about the most original reading of the Greek New Testament really aren't that big a deal. Nothing that is in question affects any major teaching of Christianity. 2. Go to BibleGateway.com and look up the King James Version and put it next to another modern version like the NASB or ESV 
you know, another translation that translates things more word for word. We'll get into what I mean by that in the next episode. These versions are based on very different sets of Greek manuscripts. The King James Version is based on just a few manuscripts, which most scholars consider inferior and date no earlier than around the 12th century. By contrast, modern translations like the ESV and NASB have close to 6,000 Greek manuscripts available, the oldest of which, at least at the time of this episode, is P52, which is a fragment from the Gospel of John dating to 125 AD, or maybe 30 years or so after John was written. And yet, for all of the differences in manuscripts between the King James Version and the modern translations, when you put them side by side, they sound pretty similar, except for the these and thous, of course. I think it is a testimony to the accuracy of the copying process that we can say something like that. If the copying process and the making of manuscripts had been this wild free-for-all, as some people would have you believe, then we shouldn't be able to put them side by side and see them as similar. They should be wildly different. But they aren't. Again, you can look for yourself. Check out the footnotes of modern English Bibles to see where there are manuscript differences. There really isn't anything major. And compare the King James Version to the NASB or ESV. And you'll see that other than the language differences, they really aren't that different. So that concludes our look at the manuscripts of the Greek New Testament and how we got from the early church and the information they had about Jesus to what we know about him today. There remains only one final step in our discussion of New Testament origins and how we went from Jesus to the English Bibles that many of us have on our shelves, and that's how the New Testament is translated into a language that we can understand. So, tune in next week for our final episode. 